Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here at the Sacred Grace Inglewood on Sunday night. Uh, we're really glad that you've joined us here, whether you're currently in a Zoom room with some other people, uh, just joining us on YouTube or whatever way it is. We hope that tonight's service is a blessing and a rhythm for you, your family, and your roommates. So sit back on your couch or wherever you are, and thanks for being here.
Good evening. My name is Megan Holland, and I have the privilege of guiding us through the prayers of the people tonight. These prayers are new and old, borrowed and original, global and personal, petition and protest. Please join me in the prayers of the people. Our Father, loving maker of heaven and earth, we come before you with a posture of gratitude for all you have created and all you are creating in, around, and through us. We open our hands and our hearts to what you have in store for us this moment, this day, this week. We thank you for your love and mercy that gives us life. May the name of Jesus be blessed above all names. We love because you first loved us. We offer prayers tonight for the leadership of our country. We pray that our president, Donald Trump, would lead with wisdom, selflessness, and integrity, especially as he is making decisions and statements in regards to the coronavirus outbreak in our country. We pray that the women and men of our Congress would serve and sacrifice on behalf of their constituents as they consider how funding can be distributed to keep businesses and citizens from going under. We pray that our Supreme Court justices would rule with diligence, fairness, and kindness. May they know the weight of their responsibility and the levity of your grace. We pray for our parish, the city of Inglewood, for which we are taking spiritual and social responsibility. We pray for every business that awaits new orders and updates about their futures. We ask for a quick, smooth, and safe return to opening up our city and the wisdom for leaders and lawmakers to choose the right time. We pray for all who work in Inglewood and for their employers. We we pray that you keep burnout and hopelessness at bay. We ask that you hold them up in their fatigue, grant them integrity in both public and private, and above all, sustain them with your grace. May they be wise, kind, and gracious, cultivating love and generosity in this community. We pray for the mistreated in our parish, for those experiencing oppression and injustice on the basis of race, gender, and income. As we know, those who were oppressed pre-pandemic will only experience more oppression in the midst and wake of it. We pray against the spiritual and human systems, institutions, and laws that keep people down and hold people back. For the oppressed, we pray for justice, For the oppressor, we pray for repentance. We lament the mass confusion that misinformation about the virus, safety procedures, and government has caused. We pray against the aggressive and divisive language that is being used to incite fear and violence. We pray for unity, peace, and understanding and wisdom. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. We celebrate the resilience of our community in the face of uncertainty and loss. We thank you for the countless acts of kindness, love, and self-sacrifice that we are able to see everywhere. We thank you for the hope that comes from your spirit, a hope that never disappoints. We thank you, O Lord. We offer prayers for our friends and family, for our loved ones, those who have been given to us and to whom we have been given. Bless them by drawing them near to Christ. Bless them, keep them, and grant them peace. We lift up those who don't know you, that you may reveal yourself to them with your pursuing love 
and adopt them as your daughters and sons. Draw them near to you, O Lord. Invite them into your family, just as you have invited us. And for those we know who face particular trials and tests this day. Grant them grace and peace, O Lord. Satisfy them and free them from their troubles. Make us a people who move out towards our city, making disciples as you have commissioned us. Strip from us our complacency and apathy, which prevent us from joining you in establishing your kingdom and will in Inglewood as it is in heaven. Now with all your people on earth, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught those he called brothers and sisters and friends. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise for. Good evening, everyone. Thanks again for joining us tonight. Uh, tonight is going to be the last teaching that we have in this Eastertide series in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, if you count the Beatitudes throughout the season of Lent, we have been in this particular teaching from Jesus for like four months or something, which is, I'm pretty sure, a record for our little church. We typically bounce around to different topics and texts, and this has a, been a long stretch for us. But I'm really glad that you've stuck with us, and I hope that you've gained as much from it as I have. I found it to be an extremely important series um, for my own personal life. Um, tonight we're going to be in, in towards the end of this teaching from Jesus, and we're going to be in a text that you're probably going to find somewhat familiar. Even if you haven't been in church world for very long, you're totally new to this Christianity thing, you're going to hear something tonight that you've probably heard before. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 7, and it goes like this. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, gives him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you, then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will, you, will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others as you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, the didactic crux of this particular teaching from Jesus is the rhetorical question right in the middle, I think. Jesus was no middle-of-the-road, ordinary orator. He was actually really skilled in what he did. Um, he was able to uh, make something personal, uh, even though the topic itself might have been general. He was able to draw a crowd and to hang on to that crowd for an extended period of time. He was able to say things that felt really personal and really important, even if those people had never met him before. 
This particular tactic that he uses here, the rhetorical question, I think was meant to be amusing. If you kind of get an image in your mind of what he's describing, uh, a parent um, offering a snake to a child who has asked for a fish, that could have been amusing depending on its delivery. And I think it adds an important amount of levity that might be missed uh, due to the gravity of the rest of the passage. And, and, and it's one of the great examples of Jesus's incredible ability to teach. This question would have made its point to just about anybody. Even me, a, a fairly dense and, and rather immature father, can understand what this question means. But truth be told, if I was standing there that day and listening to Jesus teach, I might have been the idiot that raised my hand. If he says, who of you would give to your child a snake when they ask for a fish. I might have been the guy who was like, actually, I would, have, I would have done that. That would have been something that I would have found really, really funny because I find it amusing to kind of pick on my kids, to troll my kids a little bit. And by a little bit, I mean a lot of it. In fact, I do it so often that at this point, when I say things to them, they typically look directly at another adult to see if whatever I've said is true which means I have them exactly where I want them, frankly. Uh, this is going a little bit too far, though, um, because I think that now I've started to do this to other people's kids. Um, just the other day, we were eating dinner, and Mia kept coming up to the table and grabbing chips from in front of me and eating them out of a bowl. I was giving her a hard time as if this was unacceptable, and these were my chips, and she couldn't have any, but any of them, which, of course, wasn't true. But her cousin got caught onto the idea and started to come up and eat food off of our table as well. And I instinctively, without thinking at all, lightly tapped her hand and looked at her deadpan and said, those are my chips. You can't have any of those. She looked at me incredulous and then immediately looked at her dad like, why have you not punched this guy yet? Which I totally would have deserved. So I need to scale back on some of the snake instead of a fish sort of interaction with my kids. But even to a dense and immature father like myself, I can understand the question that Jesus is asking here. Even to this rhetorical question, I can understand that Jesus is making a point about a father giving good gifts to his children. A father, a parent, a father figure giving good gifts to their children when they want those things. You see, those gifts are, um, are, are for them, for their good. Even if they're, um, those things are things that they want and maybe not things that they need, as long as they're good for that child or those things are benign, at least, to that child, a father wants to give good gifts to their kids. Now, you may be like me, and, and that teaching itself, that idea about God might be a little bit foreign to you. I'm not sure where we got it in our head, but several people in our church, myself included, somewhere along the way, picked up on this idea that God is some sort of distant dictator, not an intimate father who wants to give good gifts to his children. And unfortunately, that's affected the way that we live our lives. It's affected the way we treat other people. It's affected the way that we interact with God. It's affected the way we understand ourselves. I'm not sure where it came from, like I said, but in reality, this is the personality of God. And I think it's the first teaching that Jesus gives us in this really short text. The personality of God is to be a father who gives good gifts. It's something our church is getting used to, but there are a handful of people in our church. There are a few people that continue to encourage us to ask with courage and to ask with some level of audacity there's a handful of people in our church that believe this so much so that they're willing to ask God for all kinds of wild things. And they've taught people like me and some of you as well to ask God for things as if you're a child asking your father for something. Um, it, you, many of you haven't actually seen this yet, but you've certainly heard of it because we talk about it all the time. We do have a new parking lot and patio right outside of this building. And we're going to continue to talk about it because it's a really exciting thing. I mean, the thing that was out there before was this abysmal black hole. It was like this terrible crater of a thing. And since it's not that bad anymore, um, I can continue to embellish the story and make it sound way worse than it actually was because honestly, it just makes the new one seem even better and nobody can prove me wrong. But in reality, there was just a really bad parking lot, kind of like a gravel pit out there. And now there's something else there. And many of you contributed to that project, and many of you gave financially and sacrificially to that. But what you may not know is that for a year leading up to that project, um, the parish pastors and our executive director would stand out in that lot every Wednesday, this terrible swamp with snakes and alligators. It was a horrible place. We'd stand there knee deep in this muck, and we would ask God for a new lot. We, we kept asking him to give this good gift to us. And we did that for a few reasons. One, we believed that it was the best way to steward this building and this property, but we also believed that it could be a great gift to this community. Sometimes when the Father gives us good gifts, we get to continue to re-gift those and give those things to other people. 
And in a kind of densely populated urban area like this, parking is a hot commodity. It's something that's disappearing seemingly by the day. To be able to give this to our neighborhood was a huge thing. So as God was generous towards us, we were able to be generous to the community. This is the personality of God, and it's why we say in our generosity prayer every week that we want to be generous as our Father is generous and show the world what he is like as his daughters and sons, as his children. The personality of God is to give good gifts to his children, even if we think that he's some distant dictator that simply isn't true according to this teaching from Jesus. The second thing that we see in this text from Jesus is our position toward God. So the first thing is God's personality towards us, then our position towards him is one of a child to a father. Um, now this is metaphorical language. Kevin mentioned this a couple of weeks ago that um, this, this language about us being a child to a father, we're not actually the like, genetic material of God, although some would like to make that argument and some probably can make that argument. I think that sometimes when we overlook and maybe even explain away the metaphorical and literary language of the Bible, we miss some of the beauty of what it's getting at. But we are like children to this God who is like a father to us. Now, this is both humbling and it's comforting, if you think about it, right? Because it's humbling because when, when we are a child, we are dependent on our parents. Now, a lot of kids come into our home and your home and other homes like ours because they were not able to get the care that they need from the parents that they had prior. That doesn't mean these parents were monstrous or terrible people. A lot of these parents who lose custody of their kids were, had fallen on difficult times, the likes of which I cannot even begin to imagine. And because of that, they haven't been able to care for their children, and those children end up in my home or your home or homes like ours. Um, about a month before we launched this church, this little boy, he was a little over one years old, um, and his name was Carlos. He moved into our home with about an hour's notice, and he came with absolutely nothing. Um, he was wearing uh, a T-shirt and a diaper. Uh, he had a teddy bear, and he had a bottle with some questionable milk in it, and that was really all that he had. And our responsibility at the very moment of meeting him was to care for him and to give him the sort of gifts that caring parents would give to him, to give to him the kind of things, material or otherwise, that he needed in order to grow and to develop. That is the role of a parent to a child. The role of a child to a parent is like Carlos's role to us. There was nothing he could really do to provide for himself. It's a very humbling thing to think of yourself as somebody who doesn't have anything to contribute to your well-being or to contribute to what you have. God is the primary one who's responsible for, for uh, caring for you. That's the comforting piece. It's humbling in one way, but it's comforting in another. Now, it doesn't mean that we like wait for God to deliver groceries to our door or go to go get that job that we need to get or that kind of thing. What it means is that rather we partner with God in getting things done in our lives, but God is primarily responsible for that thing. And that means that God sees us in a deep, loving way, in, in a way that only a parent can see a child, in a way that it is hard to describe. Uh, Rob Reamer describes it like this. If you believe the things that God believes about you, it would revive your soul. And I believe that to be true, honestly. If you, if you could like start to get your mind and your heart around this idea of being a child of God, I think it could completely revolutionize your life your faith, your relationships, pretty much everything. But to be a child of God is both humbling and comforting. This is our position toward God. This is the teaching of Jesus, that we are, in fact, in a situation wherein we are dependent upon God. Humbling and comforting as it may be, we are children of God. Lastly, in this teaching, uh, we see this little bit about our posture towards other people. Now, this is referred to oftentimes as the golden rule, right? Like, treat others as you would have them treat you. It's a well-known teaching. It's a well-known mantra. It's known among Christians, but it's also well-known among non-Christians. So, um, Christian or people who aren't Christians, people who really have never darkened the door of a church or cracked a Bible, know a few things from the Sermon on the Mount. Turn the other cheek, love your enemy, uh, treat others as you would have them treat you. Frankly, the things that are most difficult for Christians to actually accomplish are the very things that people tend to know about us. Um, because they know that these are things that we are to aspire to and strive for, even if we fail in doing so. And so this golden rule is presented to us. But what Jesus says here could easily be missed if we're not careful with the context of the passage. If you think about everything that Jesus has said, it adds and sheds important light on what he means by the golden rule. You see, 
to love your neighbor as yourself, to love other people the way you would want them to love you or to treat you is actually more of a posture than it is a task. We make interactions with people a task a lot of times, right? Like we think about, okay, this person's walking up to me or I'm going to interact with this person later today. How am I going to approach them? And if we're honest, every time we approach a relationship or an interaction that way, it completely exhausts us. When we approach people as a task to accomplish, it's not only impossible, but it's terribly exhausting. Rather, when we present ourselves to every single person with the same consistent posture, the posture that God has instilled in us as his children, um, it changes every interaction that we have for the better. I want you to think just for a second about your neighbors, okay? Think about, and I mean your literal, literal neighbors, think about the people you share either a property line with or a wall with, okay? Imagine their faces, maybe their names, imagine their situation, maybe the last interaction you had with them. Think about how you view them, how you understand them. Do they have more than you or less than you? Are they of the same race as you are or a different race? Are they of the same gender or a different gender? Are they older or younger? Do they have children or do they have pets? Do they live alone or with roommates? Are they like you in some ways? Are they unlike you in other ways? Perhaps the most important question to ask you about your neighbors are, do you even know who they are? Do you know anything about them at all? Maya Angelou reminds us of this. It's very important to know your next door neighbor and the people down the street and the people in another race. And I think the reason why she says this is important to be reminded of is because until we know people, we can't, sim- we can't go about the practice and the, the work of caring for them. Until we really know who they are and actually see them for who they are, see them through the lens of the image of God and the child of God, then we really can't love them and care for them the way we're supposed to. We can't practice the golden rule. If you go about every interaction and think, I want to treat this one person the way that I would like to be treated, again, not only is that impossible, it's terribly exhausting. But if you have in every interaction the same posture, this posture of, 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 of a, that person is a child of God just as much as I am. Uh, this posture of this person is loved by God just as much as I am. It will change the way you interact with everybody. It's a far more sustainable way to practice this golden rule. This is, this is why the second part, I think, of the teaching is so important. Just as we are children of God, so is everybody else. If we can learn to understand God as Father, a giver of good gifts, I think we would learn to ask for things in an audacious, wild, and sort of mind-blowing way. If we can learn to see ourselves as children of God, as humbling and as comforting as that is, I think it would put ourselves in a proper position and a proper place in our relationship with God. And lastly, if we can learn how to posture ourselves towards other people, believing that they are made in the image of God and loved by God in the same way that we are, I think it would dramatically change our interactions with those people. At the very end, he says, this sums up the law and the prophets. And whenever Jesus says that, what he means is this is basically the core idea to the Bible. That's what he means by that. I think that was true at the time he said it, and I think it's also true now when we now have the New Testament I've said um, for many different times, you may have heard me say this, that there are really three things we can pull from most biblical texts. One is, who is God? What is his personality? Another is, who are we? Or what is our position toward God? And lastly, what are our interactions with other people to be? Very simply put, I think this teaching and the Bible as a whole and all of Jesus' teaching do this. It tells us God's personality, which is a giver of good gifts, It tells us our position to God, which is like a child to a father. And it tells our posture towards other people, which honestly starts with what we believe about them and what we know about them. You can't simply love something that you don't know. You can't love a person and care for a person that you don't don't really understand. These are important teachings and and an important paradigm, not just for the teachings of Jesus, but for the Bible as a whole. I think there's a reason why Jesus puts it right towards the end of this sermon. It's such an important paradigm for us looking back at the Sermon on the Mount, looking at any biblical text. What can this tell me about the personality of God? What can this tell me about my position to God? And what can this tell me about my posture towards other people? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you that you are good and a giver of good gifts. That doesn't always make sense to us when we see the terrible inequities in terms of provision in the people's lives around us or maybe in our own lives. 
But yet we are going to cling to that promise, that truth, that you are a giver of good gifts. And I pray that our church would see you that way and interact with you that way. I pray that you would teach us about what it means to be a humble child of God. And I pray that you would teach us about what it means to posture ourselves in a way of love towards other people. We love you and we pray these things in your name. Amen. Uh, When we gather together on Sundays, whether through video or in person, uh, we believe that there are three practices that need to be core to what we do. The singing and the praying and the homily and the variety of other things are vital and important, but there are some things that, at least in my experience, have been missing from many church uh, interactions and experiences. We believe that lament, confession, and celebration are vital to the Christian life. To lament is simply to say that the world is not as it should be, and we want that to be our church's knee-jerk reaction to whenever something tragic happens. Um, To simply say, Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy. I want that to be our posture to anything that happens around us or to us that is sad or difficult or hard. I don't think that we can go about the work of activism. I don't think we can go about the work of fixing or changing or fighting for things until we've started with that posture of lament. We move on to confession and talk about the ways in which we've been complicit in the world being not as it should. And then we talk about celebration, the fact that we get to lean on the work, um, the finished work of Jesus, uh, both on the cross and coming out of the grave and ascending to the Father. We believe these things to be um, revolutionary and transformative, and we can lean on those things. We do this in the form of a prayer. I'd love for you to join me if you would. It goes like this. God of grace, you have always called your people to weep with those who weep and to mourn with those who mourn. We join our voices together today in lament, confession, and celebration for all that has been done and for all that remains undone. The effects of sin and brokenness are deep and wide. Racism, sexism, abuse, pandemic, economic disparity, violence, slavery, and oppression of every kind. Take a couple of seconds to reflect on this question after hearing that list. Maybe discuss it among the people you're with. How have you recently observed the world or yourself to be incomplete, lacking, or broken? May your grace and love heal with greater depth and width than any evil thing created or allowed by us. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you, our neighbors, friends, family, and strangers by what we have done and by what we have left undone. Take a few seconds to reflect on this question or maybe discuss it among yourselves. In what ways, internal or external, have you wronged another person, God, your environment, or yourself? May your grace and love fill us and make us whole in spite of our propensity toward disobedience. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Jesus, your yoke is easy and your burden is light. We are weary and we are broken. Will you stand in our place? Will you hold us up? Reconcile us with God, with ourselves, with our neighbor, we pray. Amen. But we are not just left with lament and confession. Uh, Rather, we, in addition to those things, get to lean into the fact that Jesus is working towards and has worked towards and will continue to work towards renewal and restoration. He accomplished all of this through the death and resurrection, but in in that, he also continues to carry out that work for us, and we get to lean into and attach ourselves, integrate ourselves into that reality. We celebrate this and practice this by doing this thing called communion, which remembers this one 
uh, scenario where Jesus sat with his friends at a table and he took bread and he broke it and he took wine and he poured it in a glass and he extended those things to the people who were with him, his friends, his followers, some of whom would betray him and deny him and dissent against him. And even those people, he offered these things towards him, them and said, this is my body, this is my blood. And in offering those things, he offers this invitation for us to be a part of the story, for them to be a part of the story. He extends this olive branch of peace. He extends himself and in doing so says, unequivocally and without a doubt, I love you. And as we practice this tonight, as you take the bread, as you take the wine, remember that Jesus loves you deeply and completely and he showed you this through these elements. So if you take some bread or a cracker or something like that, hold it, hold it in your hand and consider it and join me in this prayer. The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. We cling to the promise of the resurrection. Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. Take and eat and remember that he is alive. And now the cup. Jesus offered his blood for you not just spilling it in crucifixion, but as it coursed yet again through his veins in resurrection and ascension. Raise your glass and join me in this prayer. We celebrate with courage all that you have done today, and we hold on to hope for all that you will do tomorrow. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, and forever shall be, world without end. Amen. Let us drink in courageous celebration.
Hey, everybody. We really appreciate you guys joining us here tonight on a Sunday night at the Sacred Grace Inglewood. Uh, and I'd like to tell you just a few more things, some key info that you need to know uh, before you go on your way this evening. Uh, the first thing that I'd like to tell you about uh, is that we are going to be finishing up our Eastertide happy hours as the Eastertide season comes to a close. But we are going to be doing some every other week happy hours. Uh, so just like we used to do when we did happy hours in the middle of the month and then we did community dinners at the end of the month, we're going to be continuing that every other week rhythm uh, by doing our happy hours over Zoom in a virtual way. Uh, it's really been such an enjoyment to get together with you guys after the service on Sundays during the Easter tide and just clink glasses and share good stories with one another and have that connection time. So hope you'll continue doing that with us every other week after the season of Easter tide. I'd also like to let you know that you can get communion elements by going to tsgeng.org slash communion. And that's the way where you can get the communion elements by driving up here picking them up in a safe way, and then taking them home with you. Uh, just another way that we can stay connected and uh, hopefully an easier way for you to participate in communion with us on a Sunday evening. And the last thing tonight uh, is letting you know about how our church is going to be changing some of the ways that we meet together as uh, restrictions start to lift up and ease. Uh, first, I just want to say that the way that we're going to meet on Sundays um, for at least a little while is going to go unchanged. We're going to continue filming our services um, and joining together in virtual worship gatherings to experience that service together. And for at least the next little while, that's the way that we're going to continue moving up together on Sunday evenings. But uh, maybe some of you guys have already experienced ways in which your groups, whether that be uh, Thankful Thursday or maybe your table group, have started to meet in person in some sort of safe way. Maybe that's been in a park, uh, you know, staying six feet apart or in someone's backyard or whatever that might look like. We want some of our smaller groups, when they feel comfortable, to be able to meet together as long as that's in a safe way and in a group of 10 or less. So we hope that you are able to start getting some of that personal uh, in-person connection here soon, and we'll continue to meet here over video on Sunday evenings. Uh, we want to say thank you to all of you who have been so generous to our church. Uh, we believe that generosity is just such a fundamental characteristic uh, of our church, and you guys being so generous is part of what makes us that way. 
Part of the way that we have been able to stay so generous during this season is by saying the generosity prayer together every week. And so if you're willing and able, can you join me in the generosity prayer? All that we have, we have received from God. We bring nothing into this world and we take nothing out of it. We choose to follow the way of Jesus and increase in generosity until it can be said, there is no one in need among us. We choose to be faithful stewards of all our resources, relationships, time, possessions, and money. We choose to be generous because our Father is generous. And as his daughters and sons, we want to show the world what he is like. Amen. And now we receive this benediction. God is a good Father who gives good gifts to his children. You are one of those children, and so is everyone that you encounter. May God's personality, your position, and your posture reflect the loving kindness of our Heavenly Father everywhere that you go. And as you go about your evening, may the peace of Christ go with you. Thank you.